Shalom everyone. Erev Tov. How are you doing tonight? I hope everyone is doing well. And it's another Thursday night. And uh, we will be studying Psalm 39. And so um, tonight, Psalm 39, Part 1. And I titled this, Does the Lord Inflict Punishment for the Purpose of Drawing Us to Repentance? And... Um, Hopefully we can answer that through this study tonight. And um, So before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can come together and we can study your word, Lord. We, just, we thank you for the gift of your word, being able to learn more about you and to draw near to you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that in our daily lives that you would uh, help us to to do what is right to stand for justice and righteousness Lord and we ask that tonight as we study your word that you would speak to our hearts you help us to walk according to your ways Lord for your glory and we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Yeshua's name we pray Amen okay so um, you can find and you know what I did not get the link up yet to post to everyone, but um, that's one thing I forgot. I was running a little bit late because I had to reboot my computer, and um, this is a really slow computer. But let's see here. Let me get the link for everyone. Give me a second. Okay, there it is. Oh, that Okay, so there's a link for the study and the PDF files at the bottom of the page there. And so um, let's read through the psalm, Psalm 39, and then uh, we'll begin. In Psalm 39 it says, For the director of music, for Jeduthun, a psalm of David, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from doing from good, and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, in my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute I do not open my mouth, because it is you who have done it. Remove your plague from me, because of the opposition of your hand. I am perishing. And with reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you a sojourner like all my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am, and am no more. Okay, and that was Psalm 39, verses 1 through 13. And so, in this week's study from Psalm 39, it's titled, uh, according to the New American Standard Bible, for the director of music for Jeduthun, a psalm of David. And um, when looking at the Aramaic Targum, the Aramaic Targum, it states that for praise concerning the guard of the sanctuary according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. And then the Septuagint says, for the end, a song of David to Idithun. And so it's interesting when looking at the Aramaic Targum that the Targum states, states that concerning the guard of the sanctuary. Why do you think the rabbis add the words 
that this psalm is for the guard of the sanctuary. Anyone have any ideas on that? Well, the reason may be when we open up Ginsburg's Masoretic text, we notice that there is a, a little circulus above the, the word um, uh, Jeduthun in Hebrew. And that indicates that there's a note in the marginal Mazora, and there appears to be a Kari Ketiv on this word. And when uh, the, a Kari Ketiv, uh, for those who don't know, um, for those who don't know, it, it's a, a method of preserving the written text by scribal tradition with regard to what is read. And in such situations, the Kiri is the technical orthographic device used to indicate the pronunciation of the word in the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Scriptures, while the Ketiv indicates their written form as in, that is inherited from the tradition. And so Ginsburg says that it is written Lidutun, and it is to be read uh, Okay, it is written Liditun and it is to be read Lidutun. And so there seems to be a difference in the spelling. Uh, there is a, a Vav where a Yod is in the written text. And so, um, let's see. And so, it's interesting to do a search on this word in the Hebrew Bible to, to see what, uh, what we can learn from this spelling uh, Lidutun. And uh, when performing a search, uh, this word comes up in First Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1 through 6. And um, in First Chronicles chapter 25, 1 through 6, it's interesting to, to notice that this, uh, this word Jedutun occurs 1 through 3, 4, 5 times. And so let's read First Chronicles 25, 1 through 6. And it says that, Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. And the number of those who performed their service was of the sons of Asaph, Zahur, Joseph, Nathaniah, and Asherah. The sons of Asaph was under the direction of Asaph, who prophesied under the direction of the king. Of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun uh, were Gedaliah, Zeri, Jeshiah, Shimei, Hashabiah, and Mattatiah, six under the direction of their father Jeduthun, with the heart, who prophesied in giving thanks and praising the Lord. And of Haman, Haman or Haman, H E M A N, Haman, the sons of Haman were uh, Bukia, Mataniah, Uziel, Shebuel, and Jerimoth, Hananiah, Hanani, Eliatha, Gidalti, and Romati Ezer, Jeshbekasha, uh, Maloti, Hothir, and Mahazayot. All of these were the sons of Heman, the king's seer, to exalt him according to the words of God. For God gave fourteen sons and three daughters to Heman, and all these were under the direction of their father to sing in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, lyres for the service of the house of God. Asaph, Judathun, and Heman were under the direction of the king. And um, yeah, the English translation really does butcher the names of these, these Hebrew people. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting when reading through First Chronicles 25, the first six verses that, um, I didn't notice this before, that, because I was looking mainly, primarily at the Judith, Jedithun, but um, it's interesting that Asaph and um, the sons of Jedithun and, and Haman, it says that they were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. And, um, down, down further with Jedithun with the harp, who prophesied in giving thanks and praising the Lord, and um, you know, etc. And it's interesting with regarding to the word prophesy that it seems that the, the singing and song is a form of prophesying. 
What do you think about that? I know that in Revelation, if I can remember where that's at, in Revelation uh, there is a reference to the um, when we when we speak of the testimony of Yeshua in our lives, that is a form of prophecy. You know, we are prophesying, and so um, it seems to be when if we if we consider this First Chronicles 25 that prophesying was a, a form of giving testimony to the Lord or here in this case of praising and, and singing and song to the Lord that that's pretty interesting um, anyone have any thoughts on that well um, when looking at first Chronicles 25 1 through 6 and at this word uh, Jeduthun um, Brown Drivers and Briggs Lexicon says that uh, this is a proper name. Okay, I'm not sure. I rebooted my computer, and so you don't hear anything. My my voice is going up and down, so it is it def you can I mean it's definitely transmitting. It my computer is slow, and so when it's booting, it it's it might cut in and out. Um, so, the Brown Drivers and Briggs lexicon, it says that um, Jeduthun is a proper name. And um, we learn that Jeduthun it was a Levite of the family of Merari. And one of the three masters of music, he was one of the three masters of music that was appointed by, um, by David. And his office was to preside over the music of the temple service. Jeduthun's name stands at the head of the 39th, the 62nd, and the, the, um, okay, I guess I lost sound here. Uh, let me, let me see what I can do. Let me park the room. Okay. Okay, testing one, two, can you hear me? Type a one if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Um, okay, you can hear me. Okay, yeah, let me put on a hat. Let me a second here. Um, okay. Okay, so um, that's good. Everyone can hear me now. Um, the the word or the the name Jeduthun, it occur it appears on at the head of Psalm 39, 62, and 77, indicating that these were probably sung by his choir. Now Jeduthun was also a Levite whose was uh, whose son or descendant of Obed Edom was a gatekeeper at the time David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem according to 1 Chronicles 16 chapter 1. Heman and Jeduthun were also responsible for sounding trumpets and cymbals and for playing of the other, other instruments for sacred worship. We learn this in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 42. So um, what do you know from the scriptures is or what we know from the scriptures is that David was well known as a musician and that as a young man and he was summoned before King Saul to play and uh, to bring them bring him peace when an evil spirit would torment him and setting him into numerous mood swings we, re we learned that in first Samuel 16 and um, I I think I had the latest in speak build so I, I don't know if that's it or not Okay. Hopefully not. Okay. So, from or hopefully I do. Yeah. Um, how do you type that in? Uh, let's see. No, I don't have the latest build. That's a problem. Okay. So, um, from all of his works found within the psalm, it is reasonable to conclude that David was intimately familiar with and well trained in the inner workings of music from a compositional, lyrical, instrumental, and performance standpoint. Another question is how did a young shepherd boy become one of the most famous musicians and composers of Israel's history? And the answer may lie in his association with one of the prominent Levites named Jeduthun. 
and Jonathan was one of the three primary singers and musical directors appointed uh, to by David. And they were th there were three key individuals that we find in the scriptures. Jonathan appears to be David's teacher, and there also appears to be a relationship between the Levite singers and musicians indicated by the Levite Heman, the leader, the lead singer, and was the grandson of Samuel, the prophet, according to First Chronicles chapter six, verse eighteen. So David appears to be intimately familiar with the various characters within the Levitical music system by the time he became king over Israel. So David, um, and that was the introduction, introductory line to the psalm on Jeduthun. So David, he opens his psalm and he says in verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth, mouth as with a muzzle, while the wicked are in my presence. So David says that, um, he says, Amarti Eshmra, Derech. And it says that I will, I said I will guard or keep my ways. And according to Parashat Ahari Mot, we read that the Lord God Almighty telling Moshe to instruct the sons of Israel to keep or to guard their ways. And Parashat Ahari Mot covers Leviticus 16 through 18. And in verses 18, or chapter 18, verse 1 to 5, it says that then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes, to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live. live. If he does them, I am the Lord. So um, note how the Lord tells Moshe that you are to perform my judgments at, uh, which in Hebrew is at Mishpat, and keep my statutes, and it says at Hukot, and, in, and to live in accord with them, I am the Lord your God. And in the Hebrew text, it uses this, the direct object identifier at, to identify that which is to be kept or guarded, which is uh, the Lord's Mishpat, uh, his judgments, and his Hukot, his statutes. And the Lord uh, says to um, Tishmeru lelechet behem, meaning that you are to keep or guard your ways in them by his commands. And in doing so, you do not do what is done in the land of Canaan or in Egypt. And it's interesting to note David's keeping or guarding his way in the presence of the wicked. And that he uses the word esh, um, eshmera derechai meaning that I will guard or keep my way. And he uses the word derech, which means uh, way, route, or path. And it's a word that often describes the way of God, such as derech Hashem, uh, in the Hebrew phrase, uh, derech Hashem, or the way of God. And, um, or as a drash, which may refer to midrash. And a Hebrew word that refers to a method of exegesis of the biblical text. So David is interpreting God's Torah, applying it to his life, and in doing so, guarding his way in the presence of the wicked. And this is accomplished by guarding his tongue. And he says that he will keep his lips with a, a gag or a, a bridle or a muzzle. And the, the Hebrew word machsom means that it's a, a gag or a bridle or a muzzle. And it's, this is interesting to note that the bridle is a device that's used for leading horses and con that constrains and restrains the animal or horse uh, to move according to your will. And so David is constraining his mouth so as not to say anything. And so does this suggest that he is keeping his mouth shut and did not do anything when the wicked did evil in his sight? What do you think? Because um, he says that he, um, he did not do good. But uh, in, in verse 1 it says that I'll guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. So um, Dave is describing that he kept his mouth shut 
because he was ashamed of standing up for what was, um, or actually that's a question, is David describing that he kept his mouth shut because he was ashamed of standing up for what was right? And, um, or was he keeping his mouth shut and not doing anything when the wicked uh, were doing evil in his sight? What do, you, do you think that that's what he meant? Um, have you ever been ashamed of doing what was right in front of other people? And I know in my life that I, I in the past I have, you know, and, um, and so I can you know, kind of identify with David here. Now David, he continues, he says that in verse 2 and 3, that I was mute and silent, I refra refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue when he, then I spoke with my tongue. And so um, David, when he kept silent, he even kept from doing what was good, correct or right. And because uh, he said that I refrained even from doing good. And so, um, oh, thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and so, has this ever happened to you before? Where, um, when when standing in front of someone that's not a believer, and um, choosing not to do what was right or good. David says that I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. And he was he was dumb or bound, according to the Hebrew text. He was silent, and he was silent from doing good, is what it says. And his pain, uh, mental and physical sorrow, was stirred up with troubles. And he goes on to say that his heart was hot, that his thoughts, uh, and he says, Ham Levi, and that his thoughts within were on fire, and then he spoke with his mouth. And Jeremiah sometime, um, said something similar in Jeremiah 20, verse 9. He says that, but if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. So David describes his not saying anything as his pain or sorrows are stirred up with trouble because of his silence and not responding to doing what is right in the presence of the wicked. Both Jeremiah and David describe the work of God in our heart that burns if we do not obey the Lord in doing what is right. So, the, the Apostle Paul and Peter, they say something similar regarding doing what is right and good in Galatians, according to Galatians chapter 6 and 1 Peter chapter 2. And on page, we're on page 6 right now of the study. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, it says, The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And that was Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 through 10. And then Peter, he said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 to 25, For this finds favor, favor if for the sake of conscience towards God a person bears up under the sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep. But now you have 
return to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Okay, that's good. I'm glad you're getting most of the audio. Okay, so <clears throat> it's interesting that the Apostle Paul says uh, that for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And I know that this is a, a little bit of an overlap from last week's Parsha because I was writing this part of the Psalms while I was writing the Parsha last week and um, it just kind of fit really well. And so, um, but in this scripture from Galatians 6 verse 8, Paul's equating doing what is good to sowing in the Spirit in eternal life, whereas the counterpart of that is if one sows it of flesh, one reaps corruption. Basically, one who gives into the flesh will reap dishonesty and money. And note that this is not simply a philosophical or theological exer thought exercise. That if one gives into the fleshly desire, one is cultivating immoral decisions which then corrupt the spirit. The moral impurity corrupts the spirit which then leads to other immoral activities such as bribery, embezzlement, covetousness, you know, embezzlement, not doing what is right and keeping silent when one should be speaking up in the right time. And Paul says that if you live by the Spirit, you will do what is right and reap eternal life. Does eternal life, you know, when we look at these scriptures here that where Paul is saying that if you do, if you live by the Spirit, you'll do what is right and reap eternal life, okay? It, does, Paul, does eternal life depend our, on our doing what is right? What do you guys think about that? I think there's, a, there's definitely a... Um, something to be said there. And if we are abiding in the Messiah, will we choose what is right versus what is wrong? You know, Calvinism says that we don't have the option of choosing what is wrong. And the 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 point is is that correct? I mean maybe Calvinism doesn't say that explicitly, but um but uh is that correct based upon what we've been studying? And Paul said not to lose heart doing good because in time we will reap the, the reward. The Apostle Peter is giving a discussion on suffer, suffering and, and the person who suffers unjustly, such as David, um, he, the, the one that bears up under these sorrows and seeks the Lord God, that... Um, he is making a, a contrast between the one who bears punishment for their sin and the bearing of punishment because of injustice with patience, uh, which is a reference to persecution. And so, if we endure injustice with patience, we find favor in God's eyes. David, in the psalm, endured injustice with patience. And Peter says that Yeshua suffered for us, setting the example that when he was reviled, or verbally abused, that Yeshua did not respond in abuse back. And Yeshua continued to trust in the righteous judge, and he bore our sins upon the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And according to Peter, keeping silent functions in a different manner than how David is describing in his psalm. And in Yeshua's situation, the keeping silent is for the purpose of not bringing unrighteousness on account of bad language. And David, on the other hand, kept silent because he had a fear of the unrighteous men whose presence he was afraid of. That's what it seems like, because he said that he did not do good. And the example that Yeshua gives is that, um, that Yeshua gave is that uh, we should not be afraid no matter the circumstance, and we are to trust him who judges righteously and that he will pay back uh, the wrongs that are, that are being done to us. And so David, he, he continues in the psalm, he says in verse 4 that, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. And in, when we look at the Hebrew text, it translates literally, what is it, or let me know what I am lacking. And so David appears to be asking the Lord to help him to realize what it is about his life that has caused him to remain silent before sinners. 
what is lacking or short in his life to cause this? And what is lacking in, in does any, anyone have any ideas on that? What, what's lacking in his life? What might be lacking? Any opinions? One example may be in the case of the sin of, with Bathsheba that, um, you know, lust. You know, maybe, he, maybe that's what that uh, is lacking in his life. And are there any things in your life that are lacking? You know, that's, that's a question. It's a, a good way of looking at our lives and um, lack of control, yeah. Self-control, right? Right. And um, David, he continues in verse 5 and 6. He says, that, Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. And surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. And so when we were reading these, these scriptures, the, the scriptures literally state that uh, it says, Ach Betzalem, meaning that even as a shadow, a man walks, even in vanity, it will crash in ruin. He will collect or gather, and he does not know who will gather them. And so, basically what David is saying is that we cannot take wealth with us when we die, that someone else takes the wealth that has been amassed, that we amass. And there is, though, however, something that we can take with us when we die. Do you know what that might be? Anyone have any ideas regarding that? What is, what is the uh, one thing that we could take with us when we die? How about our thought life? Now, according to Psalm 49, that we are to take the following attitude toward wealth. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of uh, their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. That's Psalm 49, verse 6 through 7. So we also cannot purchase our way into salvation. For the redemption of their souls is costly, as it says in Psalm 49, verse 8. Yeshua warned that money keeps some people out of heaven, saying, It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew 19, verse 23. Personal wealth also cannot rescue us from death. And it says in Psalm 49, verse 11, Their inner thought, the thoughts of these wealthy people, is that their houses will continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. And so um, we can see that wealth does not, is not sustained even after death, you know, here on earth, you know, the wealth of a, a man. And so while writing Psalm 49, David seems to have this psalm in mind when he, he uh, said for, in Psalm 49, verse 10, that for he sees that wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. The following on page 8 of the study are additional references from the scriptures that speak on wealth. And I thought I'd list a few of those here. In, in Proverbs 11, verse 28, it says that whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21, it says, Do not lay up yourself, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Matthew 6.24 it says that no one can serve two masters for he, either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. In Matthew 6.33 it says, But seek the first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Luke 12.33 it says that, Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old and with treasure in the heavens that do not fail, 
where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. In 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 10, it says that, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. And then finally, Hebrew 13 verse 5, it says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay, so these scriptures teach us that trusting in money or in wealth will fail, but righteousness will prevail. It will prosper us. And laying up riches on this earth, thieves will come in and steal, which is consistent with David's words saying that he will collect or gather, and he does not know who will, who will gather them. Um, use that we are to use money to help others um, will amass treasures in heaven or rewards in heaven. And the Apostle Paul told Timothy, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, and it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. The Torah also teaches us in Parashat Shoftim, which is Deuteronomy 16 to 21, that the king is not to amass wealth or horses. It says in Deuteronomy 17, verse 15 to 16, You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourself. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. And so what's interesting about the mitzvah and the Torah regarding the king, the one who multiplies horses is drawn in parallel to returning to Egypt. And this scripture suggests that amassing wealth will cause one to turn back to Egypt something that will result in following the ways of the Egyptians. Wealth can lead to ungodliness, unrighteousness, and sin. And something that is explicitly commanded against in Parashat Acharimot, it says in chapter 18, verse 3, You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you live, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. And so um, there are various biblical examples that we can give regarding this, uh, this, these scriptures here and on amassing wealth and great wickedness or unrighteousness in that, you know, look at Solomon when he amassed wealth, he brought horses from Egypt and look at his end, how, how he had uh, started serving the Baals and the, the Ashtoreth and stuff. Um, Shalom, Minister Yohanan. And welcome, welcome tonight here. And so David says that the one whom we are to trust is the Lord. And he says in Psalm 39, verses 7 through 9, And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute. I do not open my mouth, because it is you who have done it. Okay, so it's interesting that he says that his trust and hope is in the Lord, seeking the Lord to deliver him from his transgressions. And um, what's interesting is that he said earlier that he kept silent and he did not do good. And, but yet here he's saying that his silence is because God has done that. What do you think is going on here? Does, did God keep him from doing good? And um, what does it mean that to deliver from transgressions? Because it says here that um, deliver me from all my transgressions, make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute. I did not open my mouth because it is you who have done it. 
he asked the Lord to deliver him from all his transgressions and recognizing as in Psalm 38 verses 3 through 5 that his sin as the source of all his troubles and sorrows. And David obviously thought that if his, tra if his transgressions were forgiven, he was assured that his trouble would be removed. He says that he needs delivering from all his crime, David says that, and that the reason being is that he does not want to be disgraced by the foolish or in the presence of the foolish and or those who are, are criminals or villains. And he's asking the Lord to not treat him as a sinner or a transgressor of his Torah. So the unrighteous have something to justify their own unrighteous deeds. And in addition to this, it's interesting that he says in verse 9 that I have become mute. I do not open my mouth because it is you who have done it. And earlier, as I had mentioned, that he says that he was mute and he refrained from doing good. And when he kept silent, he even kept from doing what is good. And that, um, do you think that the Lord would cause David not to do what is good? What, is, um, what do you think? Um, I don't think that's what David is saying here. And David, he, he continues saying that, Remove your plague from me because of the oppression of your hand. I am perishing. And it's interesting now that David's saying that the Lord has brought a plague upon him. And the question would be, would the Lord bring a plague upon someone who trusts and believes in Yeshua the Messiah uh, for their salvation today? Um, what, what do you think? Do you think the Lord would bring a plague upon someone who trusts in Yeshua the Messiah? Anyone have any comments on that? Initial thoughts? Yeah, it depends. Yeah, I think it depends too. Depends on their their lifestyle and and, and how they're what they're doing, you know, what they say and what they do. You know, if they're two different things. But um, what I thought would be interesting to do a little midrash on uh, these this verse here um, from Parshiot Vayera and and Bo, these two parshas, um, Vayera and Bo, and this covers Genesis chapter six to, or sorry, Exodus chapter six to chapter thirteen. And yeah, Job suffered, but remember he was a righteous man, you know. So w the scriptures don't really list what unrighteousness he was doing, right? And so if we look at it, if we try and do a little midrash on these verses from the Torah portions, um, Vayera and, and Bo, um, studying these portions of scriptures, we find that the Lord is in the process of delivering Israel from bondage in Egypt and in the process of bringing the plagues upon Egypt. Okay, And the purpose is laid out in the book of Deuteronomy, in which Moses reveals the events of the past and mentions the diseases of Egypt in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and 28. And the Exodus plagues are, are considered divine judgments, and uh, the theme of the divine punishment should lead one to repentance. And what's interesting is that the, the, each of the judgments were designed to attack one of the gods of Egypt, and even, you know, that there was even a god of sheep, and that the Passover, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed and they ate, that they were eating one of one of their gods, and God destroyed the firstborn of, of Egypt. And so, um, each of these judgments, they were, they were divine punishments against Egypt and their false gods, and um, this was... This should lead one to repent, repentance, but it, it really didn't. In the, the long, the long story short, you know, Pharaoh didn't repent. But this theme comes, uh, this theme comes from the, um, the, 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 theme, the theme of divine punishment that leads to repentance comes from the prophets. In Amos chapter four and Ezekiel chapter twenty, we'll do a little more further studying on that. But something interesting from Parshio Vayera and Bo is that in the opening verses of Parashat Vayera, we read the reiteration of the covenant promises. It says that I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned, and the promise that we will be his people and he will be our God. 
And the Lord tells Moshe and Aaron to go to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh and to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. The Lord declares that he will harden Pharaoh's heart so that his signs and wonders will be multiplied in Egypt, declaring his glory and power. And the Lord says to Moses that um, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name I did not make myself known to them. Uh, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. And so the interesting point here is the Hebrew word that's used by God described that he had made himself known to Abraham. And this is going to be the kind of connection I'm trying to make back to the psalm, I believe. And that God made himself known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, written, he wrote in the Hebrew text, in the, the Nephal verbal pattern, nodati, meaning that to be made known or to become known. And according to the marginal Mazora on verse, and from Shemot, from Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, there is a variant spelling in the Targum Onkelos, the Targum Jonathan, the Targum Zakanim, and the Targum Sori. And having a look at the Targum Onkelos, the variant spelling is written in the Hephiel verbal pattern as Hodait, meaning um, that made, make known or declare to perceive or understand or to be acquainted with. And so the same form of the word is used in Jeremiah 11, verse 18, that says, Moreover, the Lord made it known to me, and I knew it. Then you show me their deeds. And the he feel form in Jeremiah indicates that God, causatively, he made, he caused them to know him, caused Jeremiah to know him, the deeds of the people, um, caused him to know the deeds of the people. And um, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3 through 4, God explained that he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the all-sufficient God, you know, El Shaddai, in, in the terms of the covenant. And he made himself known in the plagues that he brought upon Egypt when Pharaoh said, I know that I have sinned before God in Exodus chapter 10, verse 16. So, if... Um, if we take this understanding from a Midrashic sense on David's words, he says that, Remove your plagues from me because of the opposition of your hand. I am perishing. Um, he understands that it is the Lord who has made known his sins within the covenant context. And all of the problems that come upon him because of his sins are really the result of the Lord admonishing him for his sins and thus he can trust in the Lord God that he will keep him, and he is able to call upon the Lord for help and trust and believe that he will not forsake his people. And so when looking at this from this Midrashic perspective that we see how from the, the Torah text on the plagues, the making, of, making known the presence of God you know, is here, and um, within the covenant context, that uh, David says that remove the, your plague from me, he realizes that this plague, whatever it is that the Lord had brought on him, is uh, that he, regardless, it's that that the Lord is admonishing him, that he is he is uh, drawing him back to him. And I'm not sure why the sounds breaking up, you know, in, in the room, but um, I'll just keep going here. But um, David goes on to say, in verse 11 of the psalm, it says that, Psalm 39, it says that, With reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. In the Aramaic Targum, it states that you punish a man, or sorry, you punish a son of man with rebuke for sin, and you have dissolved his body like wool that has been nibbled away Truly, every son of man is nothing forever. Let me adjust this. I don't know if it's not connected right on my computer or not. My um, my headphones may be... Is it, is it better now? My headphones may be bad. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, so... Um, David says that 
with reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity you accuse as a moth or you consume as a moth a pre a, who, what is precious to him surely every man is a mere breath the Aramaic Targum says that you punish a man of a son of man with rebuke for sin and you have dissolved his body like wool that has been nibbled away truly every son of man as nothing forever and the Septuagint then says that uh, thou ch chastenest a man with rebukes for iniquity thou makes, makest his life to consume away like a spider's web nay every man is disquieted in vain and so the Lord takes what is precious to a man his body and the scriptures say that he consumes like a moth or dissolves the body like wool or causes his life to consume away like a spider's web the moth analogy suggests that the Lord is working something in private to nibble away at precious at a precious thing most likely the sin or life itself uh, or life itself the rabbis of the Aramaic Targum say that the Lord dissolves the body like wool it's interesting to note that wool is a protein fiber because it comes from the sheep and is based on the the chemical properties of the wool it's the the hair and it may be which may be affected by acids to cause decomposition or alkalize uh, for example the wool can be dissolved in caustic soda solutions and wool may also be affected by microorganisms such as mildew and if it remains wet too long um, mildew can result and from the microorganism perspective if the wool remains wet um, this may be parallel to sin if uh, sin remains too long it will begin to be consumed and destroyed and dissolve away life and affect one's relationship with the Lord the rabbis of the Septuagint state that the life of the sinner is similar to the consuming away of a spider's web and a spider web is very fragile and even a slight touch can upset its pattern and destroy the web the point is is that sin causes life to be fragile and the Lord is making himself known to his people by reproofs and chastening because of iniquity. Okay, and David, he concludes the psalm, and he says that, uh, in verse 12 and 13, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner, sojourner like all my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. The Aramaic Targum states that receive my prayer, O Lord, and hear my supplication. And to my tears, do not be silent, for I am like a foreigner with you, an alien like all my fathers. Leave me alone, and I will depart, ere I go and exist no more. And in the Septuagint, it says that, O Lord, hearken to my prayer and my supplication. Attend to my fears, tears. Be not silent, for I am a sojourner in the land, and a stranger as all my fathers were. Spare me that I may refresh before I depart and be no more. And so, in in the psalm, David states hasha from the word sha'a, meaning to look, which is a connection with the preposition mimeni, meaning from me, and, and it's translated as to look away from me. And David asked for the Lord to, um, to, um, wait a second here. David asks for the Lord to look away so that he can smile again before he departs and is no more. And it sounds as if he is asking the Lord to not inflict death upon him, that God's looking upon him will cause him to die because of the nature of his sin. And the context of the psalm suggests that the Lord is pursuing David to punish him for his iniquity. And it, it appears that David feels his iniquity is so great that he will die does the Lord do this today? Uh, do you, does he, the searching us, does he search us out and work in our lives to bring us to repentance and to draw us to himself? I believe he does. And so that, that concludes the Psalm study part one for today. And, and so let's, uh, let's conclude with prayer. Heavenly Father, we glorify you and praise you. Lord, uh, truly you are worthy to be praised. Lord, our lips were created for your pleasure to give glory and praise to you always. Please, Lord, have mercy and forgive us for the sin of our lips. Lord, help us to do what is right in the midst of this evil world. Empower us by your Spirit to do what is right, 
to speak words of life to our friends and family, to pray for our leaders, our brothers and sisters, and to have wisdom for the purpose of seeking and growing nearer to you, O Lord. Lord, help us to know your ways and to have a spirit-filled, spirit-led life. Lord, hear our prayers. Help us to treat all men with justice and righteousness. Lord, we desire to live holy and righteous lives because you have separated us as holy unto yourself. You have shown us how to do this by your commandments and demonstrated this in your Son, Yeshua the Messiah. Help us to walk and abide in Christ as the scriptures say we are supposed to do. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Yeshua, that we may enter into, the salva- into your salvation that you have provided. And thank you, Lord, for these writings so that we can grow in our faith and know who we are in the Messiah, Yeshua. Help us to grow by walking in the Spirit and applying these truths to our lives. And we praise your holy name and give you all the glory and the honor and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.